extended winter 2022. Crazy. The ocean's falling out of the sky in the form of rain right now, but I'll tell you what, I don't know why it's not snow. Crazy. Horses are grumpy, the ghosts are freaking out because they know I'm here. And I'm, uh, I think I gotta get caught up some sleep. I had some severe indig indigestion last night, the one that wakes up at one in the morning, hammers on until like 3.30. Sucks. I had a little bit of a volley of eating some dog shit food yesterday and I paid for it. But... Oh man, I'm missing the mountains. I went driving around to look for cool places to go around here and they're just, I mean, there's cool places everywhere on the planet, but I'll tell you what, I don't know how long I'm gonna last. Because <laughs> I need those big mountains in my life. It's crazy. I was just there, what, a week ago? And the mountains running around the north. It's funny what they do to you, the mountains. If you haven't experienced it all, a lot of people out there, you know what I'm talking about. The mountains, I need them in my life a lot. And they're not here. All right, here we go. Enough of that bad, enough of that bullshit. Let's get on with hearing some people speak and share their knowledge. Steve, this is perhaps the best news I could ever be sending you. All right. I sent you accounts of all three of my experiences in the past and you've read them all. I'm a crippled old scout master slash hunter who can no longer bounce around in the forest like I used to. I can't tell you how much I enjoy your opening intros of nature as it and vistas of the Pacific Northwest, as it was when I lived there, it truly is God's country. To refresh, all three of my savvy experiences took place in the Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Olympic Peninsula, Central West, Washington State. None of them were with kids. They were on private lands. During hunting season, not open to hunters, which is why I probably saw them. There was gunfire happening miles away all around us, but nothing anywhere near us in the five years this happened. I won't go into the experiences other than that to say that I experienced nothing more than absolute awe and curiosity, which I still feel to this day. I had friends with me at the time and we were hunting with landowner's permission and none of us thought to shoot when we saw them. We all simply thought it would have been wrong. Good friends. At any rate, it's now 45 years later. I'm in Texas, and my son is a scout leader. I know he's heard my stories of Sasquatch, but at the time, I didn't know if he believed them or not. Yesterday, out of the blue, the subject came up, and we talked about the strange things one can hear in the woods at night when there doesn't seem to be anything else to do but listen. And he said, with all the things they're finding in the sea these days and all the land and forest we know nothing about, it would be awfully arrogant to me to believe a Sasquatch can't exist. He said that, that's what he's teaching his scouts. He said, just like you did, just look at us and everything we touch. If, if I were a Sasquatch, I would spend my life trying to stay hidden and I'd make sure my sons and daughters did the same. I don't remember ever saying those words to my scouts in my younger days, but he sure did. And I told him that the native's word for Sasquatch is Sabe and there have been sightings all over Texas. He said, I know but they won't come near us. Well, that remains to be seen. The point is, he believes. Ron Buckner, you can still use my name. It's worked for me for 66 years and it still does. <laughs> okay, Ron, appreciate it, man. Appreciate the share. The tide's changing, isn't it? The tide's changing, publicly anyways. It hasn't changed privately because it's always been the same fact privately. Thanks for sending that in, Ron. Appreciate you, man. You keep them coming, all right? You keep them coming. <clears throat> Here's another one. Share my story. Hello, Steve. We've watched your channel for several years along with my husband and cannot express how impressed we are with your honesty and integrity and the wholehearted care and respect for all humanity that you have. Thank you for the kind words. And you just perfectly described every person here as well. As well as yourselves, I'm certain. As far as experiences go, I don't have any that are terrifying or even, as, or even as significant as many of the stories people have shared. My daughter and I find a, did find a few tracks in the mountains of Idaho at the start of the spring thaw 
There was still ice and snow, along with a lot of mud. We came across a child-sized track in the ice slash mud, up and around a burn pile, high up in the Payette National Forest. It was not a small bear track, with a secondary track placed over the front foot. It was a small child-sized track, complete with toes and no claw marks. As far as I know, there are no parents out there in their right minds that would allow a child to run around barefoot in the winter temperatures. But I suppose I could be wrong. Which brings me to the reason for this email. I commend you on the fact that you want to go and do your part for your country and fellow human brethren. Unfortunately, I saw on the news that the non-human idiots that want to think they have a right to control the lives of all of us local humans are going to bring on the power that they took away from you, Canadians. And I'm deeply sorry as well as troubled. I'm also frightened that if the real Americans do not stand up, we will be next. People need to realize that the government is supposed to work for us, not the other way around. I'm sorry I'm rambling, but on all, in all honesty, this is the only platform that actually gives a damn about the truth. I'm sorry this is such a long ambling rant, but the people need to hear and stand up together for freedom and truth. Belatedly, I'm sorry for the loss of your friend, Mr. Macaroni. I'm a horse lover myself, and I'd rather have that kin's kind of friendship than the kind that most of humanity seems to want to offer. Stay safe. Please keep Sarah safe. Much love and friendship, fellow freedom lovers, Pam and Mike. Pam and Mike, appreciate you. Appreciate your share, appreciate your concerns. We all share the same ones. We're all on the same team. It's amazing. It's amazing watching what goes on, isn't it? If you're interested. Another one, my experience. Steve, so been watching for your videos for some time now and a recent subscriber. First, I'd like to thank you for doing these videos and allowing people to be heard. My name is James. You can use that if you choose. I currently live in Georgia, where I retired from the military, but my original home is Mississippi. I spent quite a few, quite a bit of time hunting and fishing in that state from a very young age. My maternal grandparents spent a lot of time doing that, and since I was with them often, they took me with them on their forays to a particular area in South Mississippi. They went to most of the time. Summers, I'd paddle my grandfather's boat while he fly fish for green trout, as he called them. I know them as large mouth bass. He was very good at it. He taught me how, and as soon as I was big enough to wield a fly rod. My granny fished off the bank and perch in a spa she only occupied. They had a pop-up pop camper, and he usually spent two or three days when we went. The winters were more about hunting for squirrel and rabbit, and that's where I found my love for hunting. Gramps taught me all I needed in that regard. Sadly, died of a stroke when I was 16. And I thought that part of my life was over as my father did not spend any time in the outdoors. My mother's father picked up the mantle and began taking me and one of my brothers to the woods to run his dogs hunting rabbit. He would load up a brace of beagles and go up around Loosedale, Mississippi, where he was originally from, to hunt. He had an old step van he had converted to a camper with three beds. Once went to the spot where my brothers, or my other grandparents used to take me, over close to the Louisiana state line. I told him we always had success there with rabbit, so off we went. We set up almost the exact spot I spent so much time in for years. We had to the first day and got three or four before dark. Gramps leashed the dogs and made supper on the fold-down table attached to the side of the van, and we sat around a fire listening to his tall tales till bedtime. I couldn't go to sleep because I heard this knocking away off. After a while, I asked my brother what that was. He said he didn't hear it. Then I asked Grandpa, and he did hear it. It sounded like a ball bat being whacked against a tree. The Louisiana-Mississippi state line is a place called Honey Island Swamp. And we weren't but a few miles from it. I bring it up because I've learned from some stories in recent years that there's a bunch of sightings from every experienced fisherman and hunters that go in there. And you don't go in there if you aren't. If you aren't. Sorry. And you don't go in there if you aren't because some haven't come back out of a hairy being that roams that swamp. Anyways, we lay there listening to these knocks for a bit and Gramps got up and got dressed, told me to roll out, boy, and Load your gun. Went through the sliding door to the cab, and he kept his shells in the dash. He reached in, got a box of double-eyed buck, and gave me three. He slid back the passenger door, 
and we eased out, though not to be heard. After a few minutes, them dogs began to raise all kinds of hell, straining at their leashes. Only they wasn't trying to go to the surrounding woods. They was trying to get under the camper. Gramps started shining his light, and he caught red eye shine about 30 yards away in the edge of the woods. I asked him, was it a bear or what? Because it was high up off the ground, and I figured he was standing up or climbed a tree. Gramps says bears don't knock on trees. Besides, bear are rare in that area, but not unheard of in the swamp. In a bit, we didn't see the eye shine no more, but then we didn't hear anything at all. Dead silent, the dogs too. In a bit, the sound came back, and he said, let's get some sleep. He may have, but me not a wink. I was trying to figure out what it was. Next morning, we packed up and went home two days early. I was disappointed and I told him I wanted to squirrel hunt some. He said, we'll come back when it ain't so crowded. And that struck me funny because there wasn't anybody anywhere out there. It was a bit, of a, it was a bit remote back then. And now they have the tennis, Stennis Space Center in close proximity to that spot, where coincidentally, people have seen some UFOs in recent years. I went back in there a few times after that day, hunting for squirrel, and got that hair-raising feeling a time or two. Never went back in there again unless I was with a crowd. Listening to your videos helped me put two and two together. I spent lots of time while in the military in the forest around Mount Rainier in Big Sur while stationed in California and never experienced anything like it. But then again, we were raising so much hell we might scare every living thing for miles off. Never spoke of it after with my gramps and I also think he knew exactly what it was. Born and raised in them woods as were his people. He had about three-quarter Cherokee blood, or his dad did, and his mother was chopped up. Thanks for letting me share regards, James. He knew, James. You know he knew. You know he knew. Interesting read, man. Make sure you send more. If you learn more, make sure you send it to us, all right? And keep the knowledge flowing freely to the people. It's very, very important. Appreciate the time you just spent doing that for us. <clears throat> All right. Oh, anybody's curious, this, uh, this framed fish behind me, a friend of mine in Alabama, had it made from deer antlers from the property. Sent it up to me for my birthday a handful of years ago. It's pretty cool. It's really heavy. I think it's that ironwood or something. Had a few people ask about that. This next one is titled, Remember It Like It Was Yesterday. <laughs> Just like the rest of us in the club. I was born and raised in a small town in Upper East Tennessee. When I was about 13 years old, I stayed over one night at a friend's house. Back in those days, you didn't have to worry about your kids going to a friend's house to hunt for arrowheads or explore the local woods or a pond. I got my first 22 at age 10. I spent more time in the woods by that age than all three of my adult kids today have for their entire lives. So my friend lives in Sensibo Hollow. Sensibo Hollow. Excuse me. And it's a place known today for spooky activity. My friend and I do our normal run through the very wooded hills and valleys. And as darkness sets in, the woods start to feel different. The house sets up on a hole on an old hill with a rural paved road passing in front of it. After we eat dinner and goof off a little more, my friend tells me as the night comes, on that his mom has nightmares a lot and that she sometimes screams in her sleep. I didn't know what to say other than okay. His dad worked the late shift and usually arrived home around midnight. He said she always felt better when he was home. Little did I know at the time I would soon find out why. Uh oh. I was on the floor and my friend was in his bed in which there was a window above his pillow. The window is probably three feet wide and about four foot six in tall, inches tall. There was a street light on the road in front of his house that cast a dim light through the curtain. And as cars passed by the house, he could hear them and see the headlights shine through. As we talked about what I don't remember. A few cars came up the hill and passed and he kind of got to know the sounds and rhythms of the engine gears and bumps in the road as the tires hit them. I remember it being about 1030 when my friend's mom screamed. My friend yelled at her to see if she was okay and 
She said she was, just a bad dream. About three minutes later, we could hear another car coming up the hill, that there was a strange hum slash vibration embedded in the engine sound and the bedroom window actually vibrated and rattled. As the car lights passed, there was left standing in the window the shape of what I would today call a Bigfoot. <clears throat> the silhouette almost filled the entire window. And what I remember the most was the low moaning sound and glowing yellow eyes. The figure stood still for about five seconds, then moved to its left and disappeared, and I don't remember much until the next day. We were both scared senseless and probably suffered a little from shock. At sunrise, we were outside looking around the house where we could clearly make out deep impressions in the front of my friend's bedroom window. Also, I was 5'10 at the time, and my head did not come up to the bottom ledge of the window. So the figure we saw had to be close to 10 feet tall, and I can't imagine to speculate how wide it was. Two other random things we found near his house. First was a dead chipmunk. It appeared that something had held it by the head and tail and bit it straight through, leaving the head and its back legs intact, lying on the ground. About 30 feet from that, we found what was, could only be described as an area of vomit on the ground. I've never seen so much vomit before in my life. It was probably six feet by six feet. That's freaking disgusting. We quickly buried the experience and never talked about it again. We grew apart as friends and I never stayed at his house again or went into the sense of Bow Hollow area again. I only spend time in the woods today during the sun up and with people around. I'm 58 years old today and I still remember this like it was yesterday. Although about me, after high school, I joined and served in the USA up for 29 years and today I work for the federal government. I work deployed around the world. I'm a Christian, well-educated, a devout family man, and I believe they are real. I saw one. There you go. Yes, you did. And so did another frickin' quarter million people. Plus. Right? It's too bad you, it's too bad you and your friend drifted apart. That's a shitty part of this, I'm finding. Kind of makes me feel a little sad about that myself every time I read it. Thanks for sending that in, man. I appreciate it. You know what I'm going to say next. You find out any knowledge that can help the people, you get it out to us, all right? I now know what my dad saw was a dog man. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, Steve. Found your channel after following Can Am Missing and David Plaps. I've enjoyed everyone sharing other encounters with other beings of the woods. This incident happened to my father in 1974. A little additional information. Just call me. Carolina girl. I was raised as a, as a feral child, fell in love with all things outdoors, majored in zoology, and worked as a biologist for the state. Primarily white-tailed deer herd management. Way too many. I'm now seven. My dad was raised in Pennsylvania, West Virginia. He was a 25-year Air Force veteran, a Korean and Vietnam War vet. In early 70, he retired, and we moved to central North Carolina to be close to Fort Bragg slash Pope Air Force Base. Parents bought a house. I've included a map of colored areas. At the time, it was very rural. The house is now gone because of a road project and a cloverleaf interchange. There were two ponds, the blue areas. The front pond had all kinds of fish and a large resident snapping turtle. We fished and had a fire pit area. Never felt any bad vibes. The smaller back pond, not the same story. Our dirt driveway was very long, circled the entire property and joined the road at the lower end. The driveway dead-ended at an old derelict house. There was no other roads, houses, church, or any pavement. That all came later after the road was put in. A clear area between the green sections was slash is high wire transmission lines. The house sat up on a hillside. The area sloped to the pond and then flattened out on the other side. Lots of grasshoppers for bait. My dad had what now called be called PTSD, but back then was known as battle fatigue. When my dad got restless, we would walk the transmission line cleared areas. This helped him stay in shape and ease his restlessness. He worked until he was about seven years old. He's now deceased. Agent Orange caused, caused all kinds of respiratory issues. The back pond was very shallow, had a large growth of cattails slash bulrushes, lots of fish. 
but we always got a creepy feeling in that area. So we rarely crossed the driveway or had anything much to do with the pond. We would lived there a couple years. I was in college when this incident happened. My dad took one of his daily walks along the transmission lines. At that time, he was a smoker. It was early fall. The leaves were just turning and dropping though. So the woods were not as dense or thick with leaves. Dad would walk to the end of the transmission lines where it joined a major highway, maybe sit on a stump for a while and turn around to come back. On this particular day, I didn't hear the entire story for several months. He had felt off. Because of his military experience, he had heightened situational awareness. And he said he felt like he wasn't alone, but he didn't see anything. He starts walking back to the house. Since he was a smoker, he decided to light up a cigarette. Because of the wind, he had to cup his hands. Smokers know what I'm talking about. Around the end of the cig cigarette and lighter, the wind was blowing and he had to turn his body away from the wind and that's when he saw the creature. As he quickly turned about 90 degrees, he faced the woods on his left side and saw something standing about 50 feet in the trees. He said all he could do was stare. He was not armed. After service, he never carried a weapon again. The creature was watching him, kind of hunched over. The creature finally stood up and faced him. My dad said he felt a sense of terror. The eyes were a glowing red. And when it opened its mouth, he saw large yellow teeth. It was dark colored, but what scared my dad was its head looked like a large German shepherd dog with pointy ears. That is so messed up. For me, hearing these hundreds of people claiming the same thing of this sighting, that is just something so hard to imagine, isn't it? But it's happening. There's nothing I can do to make it stop. I don't know what I'd do if I seen something like that. It just is very unnerving for me to, to read those descriptions. Dad said it took everything he had not to bolt and run, as he felt like this is what the creature wanted him to do. Instead, he started walking towards the house while keeping an eye on the creature. The animal slash creature paralleled him in the woods, but not, but never got any closer. My dad said he was thinking, if you don't hurt me, I won't hurt you. I have a family to take care of, as he kept walking. He had about a half a mile more to the, to the house. When he got to within 25 feet of the old house, the creature turned and went back into the woods. Dad said one minute he saw it, and then it was gone. Needless to say, Dad was very upset and worried. He never talked about these things again. Instead, he started walking along the main road. A couple of days later, Dad got my sisters and me and said he didn't want us to go over to the back pond or the woods on the other side of the old house. Fine by us. He said he had seen a bear in the woods and was afraid for us to be there. It wasn't until a year later they told me the story. I didn't know at the time what it was. It wasn't until the last couple of years that I have come to know what he saw that afternoon had to have been a dog man. I listened to, listening to Terror in the Woods about a couple's encounter in Pender County, North Carolina with a RV was the same description. I've always, I've always told my hubby that a certain section of Highway 64 on the way out to Outer Banks had an evil feel to it. The road goes through the swamp, now I know why. This house is gone now and the area developed a road, a road widening project. The small back pond is still there. In 1977, my parents built a house on family land a few miles up the road. That is many acres, that is many acres and a pond and creeks. Excuse me. The house is gone now and the area developed a road widening project. The small back pond is still there. In 1977, my parents built a house on family land a few miles up the road. That is many acres and has a pond and creeks. We have never felt anything ominous on that land. I have a couple of stories I'll share in another email. My husband and I had an encounter with something on a hike in the Uwa Uharis. It spooked us so bad that we never returned to that area but we still continue to enjoy the outdoors. Take, quick, take care, Carolina girl. And there is the drawing. All right, appreciate it. It takes guts for anybody to come forward with a story like that. I don't give a shit who you are. If you've seen something that looks like that, 
with a clear visual of a dog's head. That's, that's just so hard for your average human mind to wrap around. Listening to that and taking it in is factual. I'll admit, I had a long time. It took me quite a while to give the dog man thing any kind of attention because I just did not know of it. I didn't know anybody that's seen it in my immediate area here in Canada. And uh, it's just a little bit much to picture, right? It's just a little much. I mean, Sasquatch is bad enough seeing one, but this dog man thing. But the, shit, the shitty part about it is it's true. People are seeing this. They're seeing it thousands of times spread around North America if not the rest of the world and these people are unrelated all walks of life they didn't ask for it they scared the absolute shit out of them and now more and more people are coming forward and sharing these these experiences with with absolute detailed descriptions a dog man for all of you that aren't familiar just picture that one picture that one you're going out back with the dog walking through the woods and here's an eight, nine, ten foot tall, four foot wide of the shoulder, ripped. Hairy being with a wolf or a German shepherd like head. Pointy ears, the whole frickin' works, right? It just would not be good. It's not would be good for me anyway. Would it stop me from going in the woods? <laughs> no. Would I shoot it? I don't know. I'd have the gun, all that cross, the crosshairs would be on its head without a doubt instantly and I wouldn't leave and I have a feeling if it even hiccuped in my direction I'd start unloading on it. I mean, think about it. That thing's not going to want to come up and play fetch a stick and hump your leg. It's just not, right? But anyway, we're going to cut this one short. It's part of the weekend possibly when you're seeing this. I don't know, but I got a lot to do. It's pouring rain, but I got a lot of gear to tie up and uh, Try to figure out when I'm going to go to the coast and get the new boat rigged, ready to rip. What else? Got to get the. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff I got to get going to do, but I will be back. I'll be back. There'll be more shared, and nobody's going to stop it.